I do feel like even still, like online writing is devalued. People expect to be able to read it for free between, you know, banner ads for fragrances. Mm -hmm. And then it just lives there forever and anyone can see it. And there's no like barrier of investment, by which I mean like people haven't taken that, that kind of volitional step of like, this is a story I want to access. Mm -hmm. Let me walk in the door of this, you know, online writing just like attacks you from algorithms and point being like, that's why I always, you know, was holding stuff back. Like for me to tell stories like that, I want to do it in a way that feels valued, in a way that where it feels like it's getting a showcase, and in a way where it feels like it's being treated as a meal and not as a snack. Oh my God, I could not agree more with that sentiment. Sometimes a paywall or a book you have to go to the trouble of ordering or checking out at the library is a beautiful thing. That was today's guest, Samantha Allen, and let me tell you, she is a full meal. We had such a great conversation, and she kept it really real about the business of book writing. I definitely could not have afforded to do that trip without the book advance. And I mean, since we're talking shop, I'll speak frankly and say I think I spent maybe a quarter of the book advance on the trip, if or more. Like, this was a real labor of love. Samantha shared so many nuggets of wisdom for writers. We talked shop about writing and publishing start to finish, book advances, audiobooks, and her Audible original, plus her foray from nonfiction to fiction, and more in today's episode. There's nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. <laughs> Welcome to The Bleeders, a podcast and support group about book writing and publishing. I'm writer and podcaster Courtney Kosak, and each week I'll bring you new conversations with authors, agents, and publishers about how to write and sell books. Hi, I'm Samantha Allen. I'm the author of Patricia Wants to Cuddle and Real Queer America, LGBT Stories from Red States. Samantha was the second ever guest several years ago on my other podcast, Private Parts Unknown, when she was touring for Real Queer America. And I'm thrilled to have her back as the very first guest of The Bleeders. And it's perfectly synced because her debut novel, Patricia Wants to Cuddle, is coming out later this month. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Is that the same apartment that I came to the last time? Yes. Yes, it is. Oh my God. It's so good to see you. And I feel like I've just been up in your work for like a week. So <laughs> this will be really fun. I'm kicking off every interview with these same five questions. It's a speed round to introduce you to the author before diving deeper into their work. Plus, it's just kind of a fun study. So when did you first identify as a writer? I still don't. I identify as a weird little idea gremlin. <laughs> what What do you mean by that? If someone was like, okay, so career-wise, what do you do? <laughs> I would say I'm an author and editor, I guess. But, you know, like in my heart, I know that I'm just hunched over a laptop, like eating take out, vomiting out words onto a screen and hoping that they mean something. What is your all-time favorite book? The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. What is this book? This is a science fiction novel by the author of the Earthsea trilogy. It's about an ambassador of kind of like a future interstellar federation who's kind of tasked with getting new worlds to join the Federation. And he's working as an envoy on a planet where there's no real gender, like people kind of flip between genders depending on where they are in like a reproductive cycle. So there's some fancy alien term for it, but like once like a month, people for a week will shift into like some kind of reproductive role and otherwise they kind of look androgynous or something like that. And so the book is, you know, about a journey that the envoy takes with 
one of the locals on the planet, but it's also about like how someone who comes from like a binary gendered system interacts with this world where it means something totally different. Fascinating. When did you first read it? In high school, I was like a huge science fiction nerd in high school, just like mainlining the stuff, you know, uh, Heinlein, Arthur C. Clarke, Ursula Le Guin, Orson Scott Card, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Did the gender stuff at that point, like, was it expansive for you? Oh, you know, I'm sure it was planting little seedlings for me coming out as a trans woman. But at the time, yeah, at the time, like science fiction was this like world where I could encounter like thrilling, expansive new ideas like that. Because, you know, I grew up in like a Mormon house. So like science fiction and fantasy novels were often not just portals into like fictional worlds, but like into different ways of thinking about and structuring reality, which was, yeah, nice to daydream about. I love that. Okay. What is your dream fantasy writing routine? Oh, I, um, I live in a shack in the desert. I have infinite (laughs) money, like a glamorous shack, you know, (laughs) has running water and like a picture window. I wake up at, you know, 10 AM. I write for half an hour over coffee and a pastry. I go into town and have lunch and say hi to the friendly locals. I go back home and I write for another hour or two and then take a long walk outside. And somehow through that, I am a best-selling, you know, multi-book author. Yeah, that's the fantasy. Okay, so what's the real writing routine? The real writing routine is like 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. hunched over a laptop, just like sweating and I don't know, feeling pretty miserable and just like wishing my brain could put the words together, forcing myself to put them down on the page and then like spending the next two days shaping them into better versions of the words they already are. When you did journalism, you had to like turn stuff out regularly. Are you a steady writer or are you like write in spurts? With books, I write in spurts. So like, you know, I will spend a weekend just like going bananas on it. And then I won't look at it for like a week and a half because I like feel too bad about it. Or yeah, I'm very much a binge writer, I guess, you know like the reverse of like consuming a Netflix show or something. I'll just like produce, 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 write, 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 rinse my brain is what I call it. Let my (laughs) brain get smooth again. Just no ripples, just (laughs) pure silly putty. (laughs) Okay. One piece of writing that makes you jealous you didn't write it. Uh, My brother-in-law is a novelist, and I am deeply jealous of his work. He wrote the books Elders and a book called The Radicals, and Ryan McIlvain is his name, and he writes with just like a that beautiful kind of literary ease that I covet. I feel like I have to try to be more sophisticated in my prose, and uh, an author like Ryan just kind of will... You know, he, he, like he he even writes his books by dictating them, like walking. Or, I've heard him do it like, you know, when we've been in the same house before. Into his phone? Yeah, or he has some software. And so he'll be like walking around the house, just like muttering to himself. And then you read the book and it's like, oh, this is what you were like saying while you were like getting a glass of orange juice from the fridge downstairs. You were writing like something this good. Yeah. That's amazing. So book wise, the first book that came out is Love and Estrogen. Did you write the books in the order that they came out? Or did you have one that you like sat on? Or what was the order? Uh, They were written in the order that they came out. I had the idea for my most recent one two or three books ago though so yeah some are gestate for different lengths than others yeah love and estrogen definitely though the first okay so let's start there what's the premise 
Love and Estrogen is a story about my wife and I meeting in an elevator at the Kinsey Institute. It's a love story. It's it's short. It's like 8,000 words. Uh, so it was part of a collection. Anyway, it's basically like part trans memoir, part love story, because I met my wife when I was um, like six months into my transition. So very much a time of change for me psychologically, bodily, et cetera. And then I'm thrust into an elevator with, you know, this uh, amazing queer woman who wants to hang out with me. And I, so it's basically about like a beautiful summer, but also about kind of navigating that relationship and figuring out how and why it was going to last. I fell a little bit in love with both you and Corey <laughs> listening to it. And you actually voiced, well, we'll get into the rest, but you voiced that. And it's a part of this Real Thing collection. So did you have the idea and then pitched it to them? Did they come to you? How did it all come about? Yeah, so I used to work very briefly at a digital media outlet owned by Univision and my editor there a woman by the name of Danielle Friedman was editing this collection, putting it together. And so she was tasked with like finding, you know, a diverse group of interesting love stories. I think she knew basically just the detail that Corey and I had like met in an elevator or something like that and just kind of approached me and was like, is this something you'd be interested in? And yeah, I definitely was. I mean, this was at the time the longest piece of writing I had done. So I found it daunting. And most of my writing to that point publicly had been uh, like journalistic writing, mm -hmm. not memoir. And so for me, like a big part of the hurdle was I was like, well, where's the, like the public interest in this? Like, I felt like I had to like justify it like existing or whatever. And then I realized like, oh, I can like just tell a story, like a story well told has value in and of itself. But like, it definitely took me the entire process of writing that to realize it. I love it so much. It's like just such a beautiful little what is it novella length? I don't even know. Maybe a it's little probably shorter. Even shorter. I'd call yeah. it like a short story, I guess. Yeah. But broken up into little ch chapters, how did you approach the writing of it? And did you have that like kind of length as a target when you set out? Yeah, I had a length demand. I think it had to be like under 8,000 or something because it was part of a collection. They wanted the whole thing to just be like breezy, bite size. Mm -hmm. It had simultaneous, you know, audiobook release. I th They wanted it to just be like, here are little stories you can like snack on. And like, you know, you drive to work and back and you can hear one of them in that time or something like right. that. So yeah, I kept it short and I think I told it in kind of like vignettes, you know, just like little moments from that summer that chained together, painted a picture of the relationship. And part of that was a function of like how how tight the word count constraint was, is like I wanted to pack as many stories and emotions as I could into that time. And if I were just kind of like chronologically comprehensively detailing those like two months together, you know, it would have gone over. Once I get started, I'm a fast writer. I think I wrote it in like three months or something like that. So like, I'll just get going. Usually it's like, you know, I just latch on to like a feeling or an idea. And once I have that, like I get it out and then I wait for the next one to occur to me. And it's not always predictable when or how that will happen. And then, you know, I get that one out on paper as well. But yeah, that was kind of the process and it went pretty fast. Um, a pretty substantive edit on that one, which I, you know, I sort of expected it being my first. I think the difficulty with that one is like, because it's of all the books I've written, the shortest, but also like the closest to me, like mm -hmm. it's about the most intimate thing, which is like my love with my partner. It was kind of killing your darlings was definitely tough in that situation. Cause it was like, this is my mm -hmm. relationship. This is my marriage. Like, 
how can I like, you know, delete this perfect detail or this perfect line about the way Corey's hair is curled or something, you know, like totally. everything felt so important. So it was harder to let go of stuff than it should have been, I guess. Did you have any of that, or I guess not really, you hadn't published any of that like personal essay stuff online that you were like pulling from? Uh, some, you know, like I, th- I think I wrote about sex reassignment surgery online by that point, but you know, I, the personal writing that I did online up to then, you're still kind of like holding back a little bit. I mean, part of that is like, I, I do feel like even still like online writing is devalued, you know, people expect to be able to read it for free between you know, banner ads for fragrances. Mm -hmm. And then it just lives there forever and anyone can see it. And there's no like barrier of investment by which I don't mean like, I don't want people who can't pay for books to be able to read things. That's why they're libraries. But by which I mean, like people haven't taken that kind of volitional step of like, this is a story I want to access. Mm. Let me like, let me walk in the door of this, you know, online writing just like attacks you from algorithms and, you know, yeah. Anyway, point being like, that's why I always, you know, was holding stuff back. Like for me to tell stories like that, I want to do it in a way that feels valued in a way that where it feels like it's getting a showcase and in a way where it feels like it's being treated as a meal and not as a snack. Ah, I love that. Yes. So you did an edit and then was it predetermined that you were going to voice the audio portion of it yourself? Uh, I think, I think I sort of always knew we would. It wasn't totally set at that point how the collection itself was going to be narrated. And I think ultimately they decided it was going to be all author reads. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, got a little extra money to go, you know, record my own book. I'm so glad you voiced your own projects and I have (laughs) like loved that one I listened to and I love listening to your voice. I know you have your own issues, but I'm just saying I love it. (laughs) It's the most excruciating experience on the production side because having done three audiobooks now of varying lengths, you're saying stuff over and over and over again. You're like, you know, in the middle of telling an incredibly like intimate story and you like mess up some word and then you have to tell this embarrassing story in front of some sound guy like (laughs) over again, you know, like, (laughs) yeah. And I definitely wasn't think visualizing reading it out loud in a booth in front of like two strangers in Miami when like I wrote Love and Estrogen because like it's very intimate about like what it's like to meet and be intimate with someone while you're in the first few months of like hormone replacement therapy and then suddenly I find myself like in a booth you know it's amazing uh, talking about (laughs) yeah Okay, so then after Love and Estrogen, the next thing you published was Real Queer America. What was the process there? Like, did you do a proposal? Because I read something in the acknowledgments, like, did someone come to you about that? Yeah, so I have a fantastic agent, uh, Leela at Stone Song, and Leela came to me based on some writing I had done at the Daily Beast about believe like the Trump inauguration and how I was feeling about it as an LGBTQ American and specifically as like an LGBTQ American who had spent most of her 20s in in red states like uh, Georgia and Florida. And yeah, I mean, this this was one of those rare and I feel lucky and privileged to have had this experience. Uh, situations where, you know, an agent reached out to me and like wanted to sign me and work with me to develop a proposal. You know, often the story is you develop the proposal and then you go find an Mm -hmm. agent. I think I always had that in the back of my mind is something I wanted to do, but I like didn't feel, I don't know, qualified enough or I found the process intimidating or 
I probably would have just kept doing like online journalism for years and years before I ever felt like I had the confidence to like try to approach an agent or something. But yeah, so my agent worked with me to develop the proposal for Real Queer America, which, um, you know, was a road trip book kind of going across conservative states, meeting and interviewing LGBTQ people. It had kind of the hook in the tie-in of being related to the online journalism I was doing at the time, which definitely helps getting published if, you know, like your book is relevant to the writing you're already doing. Yeah, that's kind of how that came about. And actually, chronologically, I signed with that agent before Love and Estrogen came out. Like we were working on Real Queer America as a proposal, and then Love and Estrogen came up as something I could do like quickly beforehand, basically. So, okay, some logistical questions about like the book writing process for that because you had to pick the places and there's footnotes throughout with your research. So I'm curious like how much you did before, how much you did during, how much came after as far as like the statistical parts of it. And then you also had to quote unquote cast your interviews. So how did this process all work together? (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting because like, you know, you're doing a proposal, but the proposal is in a sense, I'm going to get in a car and drive to these places and see what happens. So to sell it to a publisher, you do kind of have to present like a narrative. I'm not saying the trip was totally unspontaneous, right? Like lots of unexpected things happened and I interviewed people I totally never expected to meet. But I would say in the proposal, I definitely had I had planned out the route logistically and financially, like I knew where I was going to go. And I had secured in advance, like at least one anchor interview for each chapter. Often those were people that I knew through my reporting or just Mm -hmm. personally. And so like I was able to present it in the proposal is like, I'm going to go here, here and here. These are some of the central people I'm going to talk to. And these are the themes I'm going to explore in each chapter and that more or less held you know i scrapped some of those plans to do anchor interviews because i found myself getting more interested in like people i had met along the way but yeah i sort of needed to present it as like i'm gonna go out and have a totally spontaneous road trip except uh don't worry i like will deliver you know an actual book yeah When I was on the trip, I just took notes in the notes app on my phone. Like, you know, I I recorded interviews and transcribed uh, those interviews. But like in terms of actual writing, I was just writing down feelings, impressions, Mm -hmm. moments that made an impact on me. Often I would leave a state or however many states I was putting in that chapter with like a pretty strong notion of like opening and closing images or anecdotes for that chapter. And then it was when I got home that I kind of filled in all the interviews, all the details, that kind of thing. And at the time working in online journalism, covering like LGBTQ rights under Trump, all of that was stuff that was at the top of my head because I was linking to it and citing it right five million times a week. In the version that I have, there are actually pictures from your trip Uh Did you have to twist anybody's arm to get them in the book or were they like, we want those? (laughs) You know, I most people like I met were just they were excited to share their stories because they are queer people in red states and like reporters from the coast like often go to red states to interview Trump supporters and diners. They weren't going to red states to like talk to moms of queer youth. I was just blown away by like the generosity that people had. Yeah, everyone wanted to to talk. Everyone wanted to be in the book and be interviewed. There may have been a couple of cases where someone was concerned about like being outed or that kind of thing. So I had to tread carefully in a couple of instances. But yeah, by and large, people were just like really pumped to, to talk. So tell me about the process 
afterwards? Did you just puke out a draft after you got home or what was your process with that? I think that I got home from the trip in like July or early August of 2017 and I had filed a full draft in December. So yeah, it was again a situation of like, I went fast. Um, I like to go fast, much like Sonic the Hedgehog, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> but yeah, I just like wanted to get it out, especially while the memories were still mm-hmm. fresh, you know? Like I, in the moment, of course, you think like, oh, I'm gonna remember this forever. and. Now I try to like remember back to that trip. I'd have to go read the book again to like right. find out what happened. Yeah. Yeah. No, I imagine even because when we travel, we have one series for Private Parts Unknown where we came back and we edit it way later. And it's like, oh, yeah, our, our anecdotes are not as <laughs> good as if we would have done it right away. <laughs> yeah. No, you need to like you need to get it down. It's like a diary. It just like it will fade if it's not recorded. And then how substantial was the edit on that first draft? Um, that, that one was pretty straightforward. How, how it appears in the book is pretty close to how it appeared in the draft. A uh, few chapters restructured, things streamlined, etc. But like, you know, this was like right in my wheelhouse in terms of it being pretty similar to what I was doing online, just with like a more personal framework because it's kind of like half memoir half Mm -hmm. the road trip it seems like maybe at the beginning a couple pieces were online or like maybe the intro um how did you approach repurposing those well i had to talk to the daily beast and say you know can we can we use some of the intro and with a credit of portions of this introduction previously appeared in this article and they were fine with that. There were just like a few paragraphs of that article where I was like, I'm not sure I can say it any better than Mm -hmm. I said it here, you know? Um, Yeah, I was, I was happy. It was just a little bit. I didn't want to do a book where it was just like all things I had previously written before. So even if I had like interviewed someone before I met them in the book for like an article online or whatever, you know, I would say that I had met them before or something like that in the book or like talked to them before, but all the material in the book was from the new interviews and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that intro is like so apt. I totally get why you were like, no, I don't need, I don't want to rewrite that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the middle of the churn of like doing daily journalism, there are occasional days where you feel like fully on and you just like really state it. Yeah. And you kind of can't let some of those things go. Totally. So then the publishing experience for that book, was it already at Little Brown before you took the trip? Oh, yeah. I uh, I definitely could not have afforded to do that trip without the book advance um, for it. And I mean, since we're talking shop, I'll speak frankly and say, I think I spent maybe a quarter of the book advance on the trip, if or more, like, this was a real labor of love where like, I was taking theoretically, like what should have been the, like, the money that I'm like putting in my bank account to like, right. save to buy a house or something. And just, you know, I, I mean, obviously, an advance is part for the research. But like, I resisted the temptation to try to like, pocket as much of the advance mm-hmm. as possible, because I wanted to like, produce a really memorable road trip. So it was expansive. It was two months long and it went from Utah all the way down to the Rio Grande Valley up to the Midwest, then back down through the Southeast. Um, That was a lot of gasoline and rental car and, you know, hotels and that kind of thing. So like, yeah, it was a labor of love. It was a costly endeavor. And there's no way I would have been able to do it if I hadn't already placed it before then. Oh, thank you for that candor, because I was reading it, doing a little of the math, and I was like, this is not cheap. Like, you were out on the road for a long-ass time. 
Yeah. No, generally, I mean, you can tell from my answers to the rapid fire intro, I feel like writers and especially like there's this pressure on us to talk as though we live this life of perfect leisure and our money just flows from some mysterious fountain right. somewhere. There are definitely people for whom there is a mysterious fountain called generational wealth. I'm not saying <laughs> you can't be a good writer or you're a terrible person if you have access to that money. I'm just saying it's a different experience. And by and large, I I think it's good for people to be open about the finances of all this, you know, um, to like help people have realistic expectations about the life of a, a writer or a weird little idea gremlin, as the case may be. Yes. Okay. So you toured for Real Queer America because I feel like I met you kind of during that time is when we interviewed you for the podcast or right after. Yeah, I think I was down there doing the LA Times Book Festival. And I saw you um, after my panel, or I think probably the same day of it. But yeah, so I, I wrote the book in 2017. It came out in 2019. And again, like this was my first like hardcover traditional publisher book experience. So like I was just so psyched to be doing it that I wasn't thinking about what happens when it comes out. And then, you know, it comes out and I'm on like, I was on Morning Joe on the, on the <laughs> update, and then like I did a 15 city book tour that took up most of like 2019, and it's like oh like I did the trip all over again, but like in planes instead of cars. So yeah, it was a whirlwind for sure. Amazing. How was Morning Joe? <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> I was definitely hyperventilating in the green room going to like pee a million times to be sure that like I wouldn't have to pee while I was doing my interview. A little bit of pressure was taken off because it was a pre-tape. Uh -huh. So like I wasn't like talking live. I was just doing it and then they were going to air it on like Friday show or something like that. So yeah, but really a terrifying experience. Oh, the other funny thing about that was... Oh, my goodness. There were, like, three people in studio, but I think, like, Mika Brzezinski was in D.C. or something like that. So, like, there was a monitor, like, with her floating head on it, and, like, I would get a question from, like, you know, to my right, then in front of me, then to my left, and then the floating head on the TV was talking to me, and I'm just, like, pivoting my head around like a little, like, parrot just trying to keep up with it all. Oh my God. Whew, that would stress me out. Um, reaction wise, because you're right, like Real Queer America was pretty hard to miss. So, did you wind up coming out to people that you hadn't previously that just weren't in your life for a while? Or, like, what was the reaction in that way? Um, I would say, like, I was pretty much out to everyone. I, I think maybe it, the book reached a few people from like my Mormon past who I had like lost contact with or that kind of thing. And I think, you know, true to the themes of the book, I was pleasantly surprised by the number of people from like Mormondom in my life who started sending like follower requests on Instagram or like friend requests or something like that. Yeah, definitely like wanting to connect again. I love that. Yeah, it was sweet. So the response was overwhelmingly positive um from my friends and family certainly i would hope so i think readers liked it too and um most of the trade publications liked it yeah no i was just totally blown away by that experience it's not the piece of writing that i'm I'm proudest of, like when I read it now, I'm like, ah, oh, why this metaphor here? Like, couldn't you like do this more elegantly or that kind of thing? Um, but it would, it definitely like got noticed and got read and that just like remains like an incredibly humbling experience to have a book that kind of like gets uh, seen on that scale. For sure. Yeah. Well, I just read it and I thought it was wonderful again. So <laughs> then there's another there's an audible original, right? If I'm following your 
Yeah. Bookography correctly. (laughs) (laughs) My (laughs) oof. So M to WTF. Tell us about that. Yeah. First of all, I'm so happy that I got that title (laughs) to be published on Audible. Yeah, it's a play on (laughs) M to F uh, with WTF. It's kind of inscrutable. Um, it, when I came up with the title, I thought about this 30 Rock line where Tracy Jordan says, like, they didn't understand my vanity license plate. And it was like, <laughs> I see you eight one am I or something like that. And it's like, I felt like my title was like that, like it didn't parse at all, but like it was the best option and we got it through. Anyway, this came up pretty quickly after real queer America. I wasn't really sure what to do for my next like traditional, like, you know, comes in between a cover kind of book. And um, I heard about Audible taking pitches for originals and my agent sent in a pitch that was basically just like, what if we did a really irreverent trans memoir? Like something that just told like embarrassing, funny, weird, quirky stories about that experience. And, um, you know, that's been, it's been done before in like you, many trans memoirists have been funny or had moments of levity uh, in their work, but there was often pressure kind of in earlier times of like, well, this is also a representative of our community. We mm-hmm. need things to be like taken seriously. So it's always a balancing act between like having a personality and like being a good, representative for your community in a transphobic world. And by the time M to WTF, I was writing that it was 2020. I was like, maybe we can like let our hair down a little bit with this and be just body and weird. Like I've always had the dream of, you know, wanting like a Judd Apatow movie Mm -hmm. with like a trans protagonist or something like that. Something that just feels like, real and adult and like R-rated in the way that like adults talk to each other is R-rated, but with trans people involved. Because while, you know, it's so important to have sensitive portrayals and like, you know, really moving dramas and that kind of thing, I've always wanted to see, uh, you know, stuff like what's happening with like kind of gay representation now, like Billy Eichner getting a rom-com or Mm -hmm. the the Fire Island movie that's coming out. I want to see that that representation with trans people. And so M to WTF was kind of my little flag in the sand in that respect of just kind of like a short, silly, pretty insubstantial thing. I couldn't help but have it be poignant in places, but I just wanted it to be, again, like that enjoyable thing you could listen to on your commute home. And Yeah, well, I was just going to say, it definitely has... uh poignant moments. I loved it. And I think someone should take it or buy it from you as IP. (laughs) Uh, If you're listening, producers, (laughs) give me a call. So what was the like, how was that first draft and editing process for that one? Um, By this point, you know, the preciousness that I had over love and estrogen was entirely gone. Um, (laughs) Like, lately, with that and my most recent book, like when an editor sends back a draft, I highlight the entire thing and I hit accept all changes. And then I look at it from there. And, Ah. um, you know, I'll of course read through it once to see if like there's anything I really want to keep. But I think there were maybe only two or three things where I was like, I want to fight for this one. You know, I learned by then to kind of like embrace the collaborative process that is editing. So yeah, I think with that one, it was just tightening, shortening things up, reworking a couple jokes that didn't work, that kind of thing. Did you work with a new editor on each of these books? Yeah, I've had different editors for for all four. Was it already set up when you wrote it as an Audible original? It was always going to be Audible. And it actually, um, the 
Baby script was accepted right before COVID started. And so then the question was, where and how are we going to record this? Mm -hmm. And at first it was that like two weeks to like stop the curve. And then maybe we'll, you know, like it kind of felt like, oh, maybe this will just delay it by a month. And then it became clear like, oh, no, like this is going to like go on. And eventually over the summer... I think they did this with many authors who were working with Audible and other audio production companies. They mailed me like a spy suitcase full of like <laughs> equipment that I set up in the corner of my tiny apartment, like rudimentary soundproofing blanket hung up in the corner, pop screen, like all that all that kind of stuff. And then like, depending on the way the wind is blowing or whatever, like the airport will sometimes direct planes like right over the part of Seattle that I live in. And that happened the week that I was like recording this remotely oh, from my home. I'm surprised it turned out as well as it did because it was recorded in literal like 75 second bursts between planes landing <laughs> at the Seattle airport. Ooh. What a nightmare. Did you have a producer still or were they just like, you're your own producer now? Yeah, no, there were people on the other end of the headphones because the machinery was so like complicated and it had to be ported into like their headquarters or whatever. It was just like on in my the corner <laughs> of my apartment for a week. So I would just like wake up at eight in the morning you know, have a glass of water and like go put on the headphones and be like, are you there? And they'd be like, we were here. Like, oh my God. It's like they were just, yeah, surveilling me. Did you do anything for the release of that? Was there any sort of event around that? No, because it came out in like October 2020. So like, you know, COVID still mm -hmm. in pretty full swing at that point. But the thing about working with uh, like Amazon on that end is like they can flip a switch and make sure everybody everybody sees it. Right. So I think of all my books that I've written, it is probably the most widely quote unquote read. It blows me away. Like every week I get an email from someone who's listened to it and like wants to say something about it or I, I think at some point I I present like a list of questions I have about like the modern experience of being a woman today or something like that. And people like will email me back like answers to those like ironic, like sardonic questions or that kind of thing. But yeah, no, it traveled way beyond what I ever imagined. That brings us to your latest book, Patricia Wants to Cuddle, and your first novel. Is this the first novel you've ever written, period? Yes. Yeah. Debut fiction. Ooh, it's fun. The premise is so... Okay, so tell us the premise. Uh, the premise is reality dating show gone terribly wrong in the Pacific Northwest, and, you know, I go look at the cover if you if you want mild spoilers about what kind of danger they might encounter. But yeah, the idea for me is like I binge watch The Bachelor and Love is Blind and Too Hot to Handle and like all of these reality dating shows. I also love slasher horror movies like the Halloween movies, Friday the 13th, etc. And for me... This was just kind of a marriage of those two things. And much like reality dating shows, slasher movies are also elimination style. So it just felt like a natural pairing of genres to me. Was anybody like, hey, can you actually go back and do like another nonfiction? Like, was anybody trying to get you to stay in your lane? Oh, I think my agent was fully expecting me to. And I sort of wrote like a proposal and half of another proposal for different nonfiction books that like my heart just wasn't in mm -hmm. them you know like for me to write a book book like it needs to like really 
light me up because you're going to live with it and it's going to be like your life for three years because first you're writing it, then it's going through edits and then you're like publicizing and marketing it. So you have to really like the idea <laughs> to do it with like Love and Estrogen and MTWTF. I'm not saying I didn't like the ideas, but like you live with them for a shorter time. You just write it down. They come out. There's a little bit of publicity, but not as much around as would be around a traditional release. So yeah, for this, it was just like, I I needed to really want to do it. And the nonfiction proposals I was writing after Real Queer America, I'm glad that we didn't get the go ahead with them because it's like, I, I didn't want to write them anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what was the process with Patricia wants to cuddle and it wound up at Zando, which I didn't know. I, I'm educating myself on the publishing world now, but yeah, tell me about that too. Yeah. So Zando is a is a new publisher, independent publisher. Um, their first few launch titles are, are coming out now, and then Patricia will be their third title ever. And they their idea is like championing books that need to find an audience and like connecting them with partners. So they have imprints from like Sarah Jessica Parker, Gillian Flynn, Lena Waith. And so their idea is like discoverability is so hard with books these days. Like it's so hard to like really connect with an audience and put something in their hands and say like, you need to read this traditional publishing still struggling to do that. And so Zando, independent publisher, started by a woman named Molly Stern. Their whole idea is like, well, what if we're able to like produce books that then partners can be like, you need to read this. And because these partners have followings and marketing power and publicity sway, like that just like helps. Um, I'm like a huge fan of what they're doing over there. I love Zando. I love my publisher. I have a Zando hat. I wear it, you know. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so and like one of the reasons why I love them so much is because they gave a book as really weird as Patricia Wants to Cuddle a home, you know. Um, I didn't know where it would wind up when we started the process. I was not known for writing fiction. When I first started writing it, my email to my agent said, like, you're going to think I'm losing my mind, but I'm (laughs) writing a book where, like, a monster murders reality show contestants. Um, Well, do you think we can do something with this? And... I think she was a little hesitant at first, but then ultimately became like, you know, Patricia's biggest champion. And now here we are. Amazing. So tell me about the first draft. And also, did you know from the beginning, because you follow different characters through the chapters and you do a fun like chat room style kind of format stuff, like when did those elements come out for you like fully formed or was that something that came out in the edit this was definitely the most arduous process for me book writing wise fiction doesn't come naturally to me sort of had to pretend in my head like I was reporting on what was happening to people just with incredibly vivid language um (laughs) fake people that were in my head so initially the the fake reality dating show in the book is called the catch And initially when I started writing it, it was just about alternating perspectives of the women on the catch. And I think in early drafts, I had uh, sections written from the perspective of the host and then the catch himself, but those didn't survive the final draft. Anyway, like the interstitial sections where I have like blog posts of catch fans Mm -hmm. writing their feelings about the contestants, those came in later. It felt thin without it. Like I wanted to flesh out the world more. And what I was finding was because I was building this fake world from scratch, I kind of needed a way to establish that this is a show that people watch. This is a Mm -hmm. show that is like a like a cultural icon in America. The forums and the other interstitial sections came as a way to like do that. And it also this is a a little (laughs) craft trick with it. It gave me a way to do exposition and get all the exposition out of the narrative. So like 
introducing characters' names and occupations and a bit of their backstory can happen with the fans talking about them on the forum. Because when I first started writing it, you know, you would introduce a character like Lila May and then you'd have to have those big, long, clunky paragraphs of like, Lila May was a beauty queen. She Uh won Miss Dallas Fort Worth in 2018. Like, blah, blah, blah. Like, you're just like writing their resume. Maybe some writers are able to do that elegantly in ways that don't require fake blog posts between chapters, but it was my my little sweeping things under the rug (laughs) trick. But then I also genuinely embraced what it added to the book to Mm -hmm. have these little like breaks and these meta moments. And it became part of the commentary of the book being about like social media culture and that kind of thing. Yeah, no, super fun. I like that choice a lot. Um, So you said arduous editing process, but like first draft, how many drafts did you do after that? And like how much changed from that initial nugget? Um, A lot. This was another accept all changes situation. And then the editor who, uh, who acquired the book, she, so, you know, I'm not giving anything away by saying this is a slasher structure. Most people you meet will die just as they would if you turn on a Friday the 13th movie, go in with that expectation. And as in any horror premise, there comes a moment where you need to like split characters up. And that is a very difficult thing to do organically, hence why it's a much parodied horror trope. And so I had split up characters in such a way that two people went one place and two people went another place. And I think my editor's major ask was, well, I think these two characters should go with each other instead of these two characters. So essentially, Uh, like, from that point in the book on, like, I didn't have to fully rewrite everything. Like, some of the premises and scenarios stayed the same, but different characters were now in different places. And saying different things and the scenes would unfold differently because they were different people involved and they talk about different stuff together. Interesting. Okay. And then how, you did one major revision? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then some fine tuning from there and some copy edits, um, that kind of thing. Yeah. But that, that major revision, I'd say was about like two months of like, kind of going back to the drawing board with the last third of the book. Yeah, and then I I think we also got rid of sections that were written from the host of the show's point of view and from the catch himself. I mean, all of the characters in the book are hateable to a degree, but they were especially kind of loathsome. And I think um, it wasn't it wasn't really fun to see the events through their perspective. Sure, sure. Um, Yeah, my catch is not a catch. He is not a desirable um, option, as are many leads on reality dating shows. Do you know what's next? Oh, goodness. I do have a fiction idea brewing, and then I do have an idea specifically if Patricia is some kind of massive success of continuing to marry Um, like different reality show concepts with different like horror concepts. Oh, that's fun. I was not surprised at all after knowing how much reality, uh, mostly food channel stuff you (laughs) watched on during Real Queer America. But I was like, oh, yeah, this is very much (laughs) in Samantha's wheelhouse. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm yeah, I, I don't know. It's such bad TV, but it's so watchable, Um, which I am, says something terrible about myself and about the state of society that I think I was trying to like process and purge through Patricia. Um, <laughs> but of course, I, it hasn't worked. I'm, you know, still Chrishell, love. Yeah. you know, I, I like <laughs> my world is rocked today in the best way. So fun fact, the day that we recorded this interview was the same day Chriselle from Selling Sunset came out with the news that she was dating non-binary rock star G-Flip. We were all rocked. And now for the postscript, just a few final pieces of advice. What piece of writing advice do you wish you could give your former self? Um, I would say be weirder 
you know? Like a book like Patricia Wants to Cuddle feels closer to who I am, but I sort of felt like I had to put my most respectable foot forward. And part of that was strategy, but part of that was, I think, you know, a lack of self-confidence on my part. And with Patricia Wants to Cuddle, I was like, you know, threw caution to the wind and was just like, I'm gonna be my weird little self. Like, I don't care what you think about me making like a hyper violent, you know, like reality show, like dark horror comedy. Like, this is me. Uh, yeah. I love that. One tip for writers trying to get a book published. Write as much as possible, as widely as possible to like be honest about the state of the industry. Like it was incredibly lucky that an agent approached me and then it's incredibly lucky from there that like, you know, you're able to get a proposal accepted. It's a hard situation and even instances of good luck have to be supplemented with like a massive amount of hard work. Um, so like if you want to be taken like seriously as a writer, you've got to be writing. Pitch online outlets, start with places that will publish you, then use those clips to get bigger clips. Uh, write about things that matter to you and write about things that are tied into like whatever dream book you would want to write. Because if you can become known as the person who writes about, I don't know, cannabis for pets or something like that, if you write 300 articles about that. I'm not sure you should give your pets cannabis. This is a bad example. <laughs> but, you know, any little subtopic you want, like carve out a, carve out that space for yourself and that, yeah, awesome. that can lead to things. So, might be a hard decision, but what's your all-time favorite piece of your own writing? Very easy decision for me, Patricia Wants to Cuddle. Oh. It, I call it my I Can Die Now book because if I died now, I'd feel like, yeah, I, like I did the thing I wanted to do. Oh, amazing. I didn't know which one you were going to pick. I thought maybe almost love and estrogen, maybe I was going to That guess. is Corey's favorite, but it's also the one in which she features most prominently. So, yeah. I get her, why she, that's her favorite, totally. So, pre-orders, very important, right? This is what I keep hearing. Yes, uh, that matters quite a lot to me. Xandoprojects.com, Z-A-N-D-O, is uh, where you can go. But you can also pre-order it from your retailer of choice, Barnes & Noble, Bookshop, Amazon. Um, I have no judgments. I prefer you to get it from an indie bookstore. Uh, ultimately, what matters most to an author's bottom line is that you do get it. So, pl yeah, please pre-order it from wherever you pre order books. Amazing. And then how can listeners connect with you on the internet? I am at SLA writes uh, on Twitter. And um, my Insta is private, but not for secret reasons. So if you send me a follow request, I'll likely let you in on all my Sphinx cat photos. I am N-E-E-B-E-S-S -E -E -S on Insta. Uh, Nebes. What is Nebes? Uh, it is, uh, <laughs> it's derived from the name of the college bookstore in Johnson City, Tennessee, which was called Nebo. And my friends and I joked that it sounded like a race of space aliens and that women from Nebo would be called Nebeses. Uh, you reference yeah. this in Real Queer America, don't you? I, I think so. Yeah, yeah, we did a photo shoot as Nebuses, uh, like just for the hell of it. Yeah. That's so funny. Okay, thank you so much, Samantha. This has been so amazing to chat with you. This has been lovely. Thank you for having me. So that's it for the first ever episode of The Bleeders. I am so glad you decided to tune in. I'm your host, Courtney Kosak, and I hope we can connect on social media between episodes. I am at Courtney Kosak, K-O-C-A-K, on Twitter and Instagram. I hope you'll let me know authors that you're loving, books you're loving, people you'd like to hear from on the podcast. And of course, make sure you're signed up for the Bleeders Companion Substack. The link is in the episode description, and we are just going to start a community over there. So I hope you'll join me. And I hope you'll join me Tuesday for a great interview with feminist noir author Hallie Sutton. In the meantime, happy bleeding. Happy bleeding.